Please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Philippians, and please stand with me as we read God's Word. <clears throat> Beginning in the first chapter with verse 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, since I have you in my heart, whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you again for this Mother's Day, and we thank you for the, again for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Father, we pray that this day, as your spirit would attend to the word, that the words of black and white might become living words, so shaping our hearts and minds so that we reflect Jesus Christ truthfully and honorably and authentically. May Heavenly Father, your spirit direct us, help us to be convinced and convicted of God's ways so that we may dwell more fully in them. And in all things, Heavenly Father, we would pray that even on this day, even in the poor, fallible words of a preacher, the words of life may be found. For we ask it in your son's name and for his sake. Amen. This is a meddling sermon. I'm going to get it out early. Meddling means you're going to dabble in some things you probably shouldn't. First of all, I'm not a mother. I never have been a mother. I'm not set up to be a mother. Now, I have had a mother who was a Christian mother, and I live with my wife who is also a mother. I know some things about mothering, but a lot of things go beyond my abilities. So that's why I say meddling. Let me begin with the truth statement. A mother's love, God's love is never like a mother's love. A mother's love may be like God's love. Do you understand? In other words, when we look at mom, mom did not come before God. If mom learned anything about love, it had to come from the source of love, and we know that God is love. And if our mothers have been walking with God, if they have any insight into who God is, if they have any natural gifting in love, it's because God is the source of that love and because of God's love is shed abroad in our hearts that we begin to love as we have been loved. We love because of what we know love to be. And as I said earlier in prayer, there are some mothers who never understood what love is. This morning, I want to be able, with the Apostle Paul's help in the book of Philippians, to map out what love is. Now, that's a big topic. I'm not going to be able to cover a lot of it. It's going to be flying by, so please hold on and help me. You know, they say when you're preaching in a church and somebody in the back yells, oh, God, help them, that's not a good thing. So if this morning I hear that, that means you got to start praying, okay? First thing is, love is contractual or better yet, covenantal. In the beginning, God determined, he took an action, and in taking that action, he created the world and put into his temple, into his creation, his image, 
Adam and Eve. God determined to show Adam and Eve his steadfast love. He promised to be faithful when he sat down on creation. He has promised to sustain the world through his goodness and grace, to make it ever fruitful, ever productive. God has promised that he would supply our needs. Amen? Amen. That's what we take for granted. Uh, yesterday, I tilled the garden. Wouldn't you know, spinach was already on the way up. I put that in last year, or better yet, God somehow made it happen this year. I don't know how that is, but the world in which we live, God gives and gives and gives. And when you look at tomatoes, how many seeds are in a tomato? Couldn't just put one in there? But no, God has that way of putting thousands in there because life is meant to be lived abundantly. That's how God's love is. It's meant to be abundant in our lives. It's meant to be overflowing. God lavishes his grace upon us. Do you ever have a Sunday where they put that hot fudge on top and all of a sudden it starts to ooze out over the side? That's a picture of God's love. It's lavished. It oozes out over the side. And that's what God has done for us. He's poured his love into our life. I didn't ask for that. Adam didn't ask for that. But God determined to be so, and he extended his love to Adam covenantally, which meant that Adam had the opportunity to return God's love to him and to say, God, I love you. I accept what you've done for me. I thank you for what you've done for me. I want to live so that you're honored and glorified. But you all know the story, how that got twisted. And instead of wanting to give God the glory for the one who began all things, we want it to be equal with God and determine all things. And so the fall came. But God didn't stop there. You remember the story he found Abraham. And he said to Abraham, my love is going to be upon you. Those whom you bless, I will bless. Those whom you curse, I will curse. And through that grand procession, finally we get to Jesus Christ, the true Israel of God. And there Jesus Christ takes upon himself our sin and he becomes our covenant so that he is ever faithful. He is never lacking in grace. He is always extending back to the Father love and praise and always extending from the Father love and grace so that we are recipients on a continual basis of God's love and grace and Christ pleads for us and prays for us and helps us to make up what's lacking in our lives by teaching us his will in the ways by imparting into our life the Spirit of God. Somewhere in time, and please give me grace, mom made a decision. I don't think mom made the decision as carefully as God made the decision. Norm and I certainly didn't. We thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to have children? And Stephen came. And I had a brother who was 11 months my junior who passed away at 21, and I was an only child. And I said, Norm, before we're having one, we're having three. And she said, okay. And so Caleb was born 14 months after Stephen. And then Sarah came 22 months after Caleb. And then I think it was 18 months after that. Lydia came. Now, I have to tell you how Lydia came. Please understand our family. We were sitting at the dining room table, and Stephen was on my right. Caleb was on my left. Sarah was on Norma's right. And there was an open chair. Norma, with tears, said, that chair will always be open. And that's how Lydia came into the world. Meet the quote of Lydia. We got the dining room filled. I tried to convince Norma we were one over the bathroom toothbrush holder, but that didn't sway. It has been a journey 
that we did not understand what it was. Motherhood, fatherhood is a covenantal relationship with our children. In that covenantal relationship, we promise to love as God has loved us, our children. Whether we understood that or not. Many folks began families quite differently than two parents deciding to bring into the world children. But that does not eradicate the covenant that was made. That covenant is made, and I thank God, not only for the mothers who've been faithful to that, but for the mothers who've been extremely faithful to that, who have done so on their own without the partner. They deserve our honor and respect as well. For single parent taking upon themselves the work of parenting by themselves and being faithful to that covenant is amazing. That's what Paul the Apostle is trying to tell us about love. God entered into a covenant relationship with us, and we enter into a covenant relationship with God. As you have loved us, so we will love you. As you have become our God, we will be your people. We will reflect your image into the world, O oh God, because of your loving kindness toward us. We will show loving kindness toward others. It's a contractual agreement. That's what the word fellowship means. And when Paul talks about having this fellowship in Jesus Christ, part of what he's talking about is the primary relationship of every Christian is the relationship between them and their God, between our Heavenly Father and myself. And one of the great reasons we gather together as Baptists, and one of the great things that we do as Baptists is we poke into each other's lives because I want to know what God's been doing in your life. Somebody said it this way, a personal experience is the only experience a person can have, which means I can't have your experience with God. And if I want to know who my father is, I have to ask you for your testimony. I want to know what God's been doing in your life. What has been teaching you? How do you understand God's word? How do you understand God's will and his ways? I need to know from you so that I can have insight into who God is and what he's done. Because when I do, I get a bigger picture of my father. Do you know that our children now talk amongst themselves as adults without consulting Norma and I? You know, they plot and plan. We pick this up occasionally because somebody drops something on Facebook or somebody drops something in an email. We say, when were you talking to them? You're supposed to only talk to us. <laughs> Things have changed. That's the wonderful part, too, about contractual relationships. The contractual relationship Norman and I had with Stephen, our firstborn, isn't exclusively Stephen's. See, when Caleb came in, he had to put up with a brother. He had to learn how to love that brother like we love that brother. And Caleb, oh, poor Caleb. One day we were going down in the car, and I remember we were going along the road, and Sarah was in the middle. One brother, Steve, on the right Caleb on the left, and we were going down the road, and Norma is trying her best to say, Sarah, stop crying. Look at, look at the cows. Look at the cows. Look at the fields. Look at the trees. He was trying everything to get her to be quiet. And she said to Caleb, Caleb, can you help? And he just slugged her. <laughs> Norma said, that's not helping. <laughs> but as part of the covenant of love, each of our four children had to understand that we loved them and they were to love each other. You know how many times do we have that conversation? You can't do that to your sister. I don't care what she did to you. Stop touching her. Don't be like that. Say nice. I don't want to hear it. If it's not a positive statement, do not tell me. Do everything without grumbling and complaining so that you may be blameless and pure children of God. That was the most quoted verse in my house. 
We wanted our children to love each other as we loved them and we loved each other. But it's a contractual agreement with God. And what we wanted our children to know is no matter how much we love you, God loves you more. No matter what we give to you, God gives you more. No matter what we can do for you, God can do more. When you go to school, when you're away from us, you're never away from God. When you're going down the road, Jesus is always with you. He will always care for you. He will always be with you. When you're out of our sight, you're never out of God's sight. Oh, we tried to impress on them over and over again the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. We did not do it perfectly. There were times when we failed miserably. We allowed our own selfish interests, we allowed our own tempers, we allowed our own frustrations to come in. And that was another part of the contract. We had to teach our children how to forgive and also how to ask for forgiveness. We had to teach them what it meant to truly love and to be honest. You know, there were times our children did wonderful things, but we also had to tell them, you're not the only one. You could have done better. You could have worked harder. Don't blame it on this or that. It was you, and you need to own the responsibilities for that. And all of those lessons come to us. And Paul tells us that in the body of Jesus Christ, because of that primary contract that we have with God, we are also bound contractually or covenantally to each other. And therefore, we need to care for one another. John, the apostle, in 1 John, carries it a little further, and he says, listen, love isn't simply a saying. It isn't simply a desire. Love is an action. Who can say, I love God and I see my brother in need and I don't do anything to meet that need? That's not love. It's the same thing within our family. If one has a need, we try to embrace that one and provide as best we can for them. This is the family of God, and therefore there are going to be times when we have those who are in need, who are going through the valley of the shadows, who are financially in distress, who are feeling lonely, who have lost loved ones. There's a myriad of things of which happens in a family of which we need to be engaged in. And so the Apostle Paul says, even me, I'm in prison, but while I'm in prison, you cared for my needs. The government never cared for the needs in Rome. It was always your family had to do it. Well, Paul's family didn't do it, but his family in Christ did it. They met the need. Don't look for the government to do this. Don't look for some outside agency to do this. If we have needs, we are to love and care for each other because that's the agreement we have with God that he will love us and care for us. Therefore, we care for each other. Now listen carefully. We live in a day and age when they're trying to tell us that science is the thing that you need to use to guide your life and your decisions. And I will tell you what Paul says. Remember the covenant we have with God. It is God's love that determines what is good, what is pure, what is right, and what is honorable. So when we make decisions, we don't make decisions based upon what the scientific theory is. We say, how has God loved us? Therefore, we ought to love as God has loved us. How patient has God been with me? That's how patient I should be with others. How kind has God been with me? Then that's how kind I should be with others. How loving has God been with me? That's how I am to be with others. And when I think about my relationship with God, when I have made the mistakes, when I have fallen short, how has God worked in my life? 
Has he ignored me? Has he punished me? Has he pushed me away? I find in those moments God's love overwhelms me. And because it overwhelms me, it breaks my heart to think that I could do that to my God. My mother had a taste of that. There came a time in her life where if she really felt that I was wrong about something, it broke her heart. And do you know how bad you want to make your mother stop crying? What a terrible thing. I did that. But isn't that the message of the gospel? I put Christ on the cross. No one else. That was me. And mothers at times have to say to their kids, you own this. This is not who you were raised to be. This is not what I wanted you to be. But my mom never took the love away. The tears cried, turned to tears of joy, because in time she saw her prayers answered according to her desire and according to God's. That's what Paul says. Paul says love is contractual. Love is also contractual in the sense that it doesn't only affect my relationship with God, but it reflects my relationship with the church, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen, God chose them. I didn't. I didn't have a choice who my brother was going to be, Stephen. My folks made that decision. My kids didn't have a choice who the siblings would be. I don't have a choice who's going to accept Jesus Christ. That's God's decision. But if they love the Lord they love, then they are to be loved by me. They're my brother and sister in Christ. And then the last is, you make decisions as a body, not by how much money we have, or not by what the theory is, or not by what reason is. You make the decision by what God's love is. And in making those decisions, it causes you to do some strange things. For what you may think should be a very harsh thing may turn out to be a very gentle thing. Or what may be something so strange as to say it's okay may end up over here saying, no, you're going to have to work that out. Love causes you to make the decisions that says it's important for you to learn how to sacrifice yourself for others, just as Christ sacrificed himself for us. And the mother's chief job is to sacrifice for her children, to teach her children how to sacrifice for others. And if we do that, God is honored and glorified, and the world in which we live is blessed. Happy Mother's Day. May God allow you to live out the covenants. Here's a footnote. We got grandchildren. I didn't ask for that. That was a decision Norm and I made a long time ago. Do you notice how that decision just keeps multiplying? And some of you have great-grandchildren, and some of you may have great-great-grandchildren. Guess what? You're not exempt. The love of God needs to flow there, and your love needs to flow there. So you have the privilege and the great responsibility of allowing your love to touch generations so that they might come to know the love of God in Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, bless us. Give us wisdom and insight because, Lord, if we're parents... Not only do we depend upon your love and grace, but our children do. Teach us again fresh and new how to love as we have been loved, how to put all of those graces into play so that others might see Christ living in us, especially our children. Forgive us for our shortfallings, Heavenly Father. Help us to realize that with grace, every day is a new beginning. We are not determined by what we were. We have the opportunity in Jesus Christ to be what you've called us to be. Forgive us for the times when we have failed and ask, O oh God, that you would allow your spirit to accompany us
to give us grace so that we might prove to be a renewed people who show your love and grace. For we ask it in Christ's name, amen.